Hello, everyone. Welcome to the UX and Data Meetup. So, hi, my name is Matt Weber. I'm one of the co-organizers co -organizers of the UX and Data Meetup. Uh, we also have Bill Prickett over there, and he's making a video of tonight's show, and he makes a video of every show, and you can go back to the uh, go back to the Meetup page and find a link to this later on if you like. And usually we have Kim Moy here also. She's also one of the co-organizers, but she's, uh, she's just here in spirit tonight. Um, let's see, we're, we are here at Workbench, a great space. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about it, and let's, uh, we're going to have Allie come up here and tell us a little bit about it. Hey guys, how are you? Hello! Um, who's been here to Workbench before? Oh my gosh, so many of you. Welcome back. Probably because you've gone to this awesome meetup. We're so proud to host you guys every month. Um, Workbench is an enterprise technology venture fund here in New York City. Um, we have a passion for what we call suits and hoodies. So if you're on the corporate side um, or the startup side, we love to bring the two together. Um, my name is Ali. I lead community here. So please ask me any questions if you have them and um, enjoy tonight's show. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we get this space for free. Thanks to Workbench, so we're really, really, really glad and thankful for everything they give us. Um, we're also sponsored by Zoom Data, which creates the, the fastest visual analytics for big data. So, so ridiculously fast. So, if you have billions of records of data and you want to see some visual analytics in real time, that's the best platform that you can use. Um, we also have some something interesting for tonight. Okay, we have a well. Um, let me go before I talk about what we're giving away. We tell you about what it is. It is um, there's a workshop on November 17th on building world-class business dashboards, and it is given by our speaker from the June UX and Data Meetup, uh, Steve Wexler, and we've, it's going to be a door prize for today. So Steve is uh, an, an Iron Viz champion for Tableau. He's one of the best visualization experts in the world, um, and he's a great speaker. So it's a it's a special prize. So let's see how this is going to work out. Okay. Um, I've got everybody's names loaded up in here. Um, I don't like Verdana. Let's go with Comic Sans. And uh, let's see who's going to win tonight. Steve. Steve, are you, are you here? No. Okay. Let's see who else is going to go. All right. Steve would have sat right there in that, in that sofa. Swathi. Swathi. Is that, Swathi, is that you? Yay! I, I, I don't have anything to physically give you at the moment, but I'm going to take a screenshot of your name, and uh, if it, let's talk like right afterwards. We'll get you the ticket. Uh, a $350 value. Congratulations. So there's, there's one last um, opportunity I want to talk about for a moment. Um, um, it's a, for a project called Sustainable Peace Project at Columbia University. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got Larry Leibovitz, he's going to tell us a little bit about it, very special project. And we've lost a... Oh. Um, so this is really sort of a volunteer opportunity, but I work, I'm at Queens College at the City University of New York, but also an adjunct at Columbia University. And the group at Columbia has been working to try to identify uh, what are the conditions for sustainable peace in the world. And they work with people throughout the U.S. and around the world. And they're a bunch of social scientists, and they're trying to figure out how this thing influences that thing. So I turn that into a quantitative model, and we're using data science techniques uh, to try to actually measure some of those variables. But we have to make that intelligent, not only to other academics, but policymakers that are going to use that information. So we're looking for some help in actually doing the design of an interface to both present data and have people interact with it. And this is an interesting volunteer opportunity because not only of the sustainable piece, but it's actually a pretty tricky project to understand how you show things that change in time and how to make it really useful for very unsophisticated users. And if you want more information, you can talk to me. And I've also brought some more information on this um, uh, analog read-only uh, data media here also. Thank you. Wait, hold on, hold on. So, Larry, I, I believe that there's a very I, I believe there's a very big uh, first client, so to speak. I don't know if client's the right word, but you're working with a big organization for it as well that gives it a lot more... Right, so, so we're working with a number of organizations, including the uh, United Nations and the World Bank and a number of places like that. So we're tying in right now to United Nations initiative, 
which they have once every 10 years to define goals for the UN. So we're trying to see what we can give in, in terms of what final document and what direction you're trying to go in. Right. And thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'll be posting those documents from Larry to the meetup group as well. It's a sort of a special opportunity to do something very, very meaningful, and these kinds of opportunities don't come up very often. Um, and, well, well, that brings us to Ben. Hey, Ben. Hi. Oh. oh. <laughs> that was maybe too close. Yeah. yeah. So um, We'll keep our distance. So, um, Ben and I, uh, we work together. We, we teach together at Columbia University. We teach a class called uh, Analytical Applications together. Um, so I get a chance to see Ben talk about his work a lot and brings that to students. And um, it's always very fascinating because Ben works at, with data at a variety of different scales, very large scales, very small scales. And that creates a very unique kind of problem, especially when you're dealing with a, with a, with a, with a product, a product such as, would you call Jet a product? Uh, a brand. A brand. Okay, a brand that is as moving as fast as Jet, right? Yeah. Um, so really interesting, Ben's, and Ben's a great speaker. So we're really happy to have him here tonight. Let's get a round of applause for, for Ben. Now. Thank you. Uh, just a quick audio check, are we good? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, let me do the dreaded uh, switch over to another screen. And then uh, we put some cords here so that I can easily trip at any point during the presentation, so be ready for that. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk to you about blending big and little data. Before I do that, though, I just wanted to understand uh, the different folks that are here. How many of you are UX people? Okay. And then how many of you are in a data role, like analytics or insights? Okay, so it looks like almost about half and half. Um, okay, so I think you'll find some things relevant. Uh, before I talk specifically about kind of blending big data and little data, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm Ben Babcock. Um, I have worked at a variety of places, um, startup, Microsoft, Amazon, and Jet.com. Uh, and at each of these places, I really sunk my teeth into the role, right? I didn't just kind of bounce around from different place to place. I actually kind of stayed for a while, got a feel for the organization, the products. Um, and at each of these places, I played pretty much the same role, a researcher within the realm of UX. Now, as you may know, like when you're in the realm of UX, like you oftentimes straddle the line between design, research, analytics. Um, now, at Microsoft, I worked on Xbox games. Um, hardware, uh, so like new devices, um, some of which were good and some were not so great. Um, and then at Amazon, I was there uh, for um, quite a while and I had the opportunity to work on a variety of things, including Amazon.com, uh, some of the devices that we uh, went to market with, as well as the grocery business. And then at Jet, I've had the opportunity to kind of work on everything. I got in um, early days right before we launched, um, so I've had the opportunity to kind of touch everything. It's very much a startup. Uh, it is local, it's right across the uh, water there, right across the Hudson and Hoboken. Um, now, one of the things that's unique about my career that I've, I've had the, the fun experience is I've worked at a startup, I worked at a big corporation, I worked at a startup that became a big corporation. I joined Amazon in about 2004 and it was pretty small at that time. Um, and then by the time I left, there were a couple hundred thousand employees. Um, and then at Jet, I'm back to a startup. Um, and let me tell you about Jet, because it's a little different. So Jet is a new online marketplace. It's an e-commerce website. Uh, we sell directly to consumers. Um, we have a variety of merchants that sell on Jet. And it's different. Prices drop as you shop. How many people have heard of Jet? Whoa, everybody, that's good. Brand awareness 100%. Uh, okay, so a couple other quick things. So in our first year, uh, we attracted millions of customers. We had a billion in sales, which is kind of unprecedented. And then we were uh, bought by Walmart uh, for 3.3 billion. Um, I'm just gonna very quickly show you what we mean by prices drop as you shop. So if you buy something, we know we can put it in the same box as the other stuff you ordered. That saves us money because we can ship it to you in fewer boxes. Um, so we pass that savings back to you. So that's one example. Other things you can do, you can waive the ability to return an item, which saves us money because we don't have a customer service call to deal with. We turn that savings back to you and give that to you as savings on the website. So in that really short period of time, I moved out here from Seattle in 2015, we built a website. 
not just a website, we had to build apps, and we also had to build a mobile web experience and a desktop experience. We had to build a team. We had to build an office. So we, we had this office like built around us. Uh, we were like in a space and like it was expanding um, around us um, to the point where it now looks like this. It's a really cool office over in Hoboken overlooking the city. Um, we had these big huge fulfillment centers. Those are about 900,000 square feet. Um, it looks like this on the inside. So when you're shopping an e-commerce website, you're really kind of shopping for stuff inside of these fulfillment centers. They're so big that you have to ride a bike to get around. Um, it's crazy. Uh, none of that, we had to design a box. Like, how are we going to ship this stuff to you? So we had to create a brand, a brand that we could put on this box, right? It's a marketing vehicle. Um, we got to shoot photos of the, the products. So we had to build a photo studio. We built that inside our fulfillment center. Um, we had to build a customer service team. So we have a couple hundred people in Salt Lake City to answer the phone, respond to emails, and address any issues you might have. Now, an important point about something I called out earlier, the startup versus the uh, large company. Um, this is what it's like to work at a startup, okay? It's, it's kind of scary. Um, it's a little hectic. Everybody's going in different directions. You're just trying to kind of survive, right? And then you get to like a medium-sized business and it looks like this, right? Things are getting a little bit more organized. Uh, there's some direction shaping up. Um, Roles are getting a little bit more specific, right? Like, oh, I'm on this team, or I'm on this part of the business. Um, and then you get over to the big corporation, and it looks a little bit like this. Things are really organized. They're, there's clear direction, and there's specificity, right? Like, I'm on this team, doing this one little thing. Uh, maybe, not, maybe not a little thing, but doing this thing, highly specific. Um, but it can oftentimes end up like this, right? And this is like the massive corporation, right? This is where it's too organized, it's change averse, there's like micro specificity, right? Like, I work on that one thing, on that one place, on that one page. Um, and I say all this because it's an important part of understanding how to be effective within the context of analytics, research, design. Um, you have to understand your organization, right? This is like a classic org structure, an org chart, you got a leader, then you've got leaders, and then you've got managers, and then you've got people just doing stuff. Right? That's prob we're, we're probably down here, I'm guessing. Um, but uh, this is what it typically looks like. And I always argue that you're missing one person in a typical org chart. That's your customer. They need to be part of your org chart. And I'm going to kind of show you how we do that at Jet. And then your leaders have another set of people they worry about. This is Wall Street, right? I put them, made them green, right? They, these are the shareholders, right? So you have this interesting org chart that's meant to create amazing experiences using data, uh, but everybody's kind of, who, who are we working for, right? Like, where do we take the product direction? From these people that are trying to tell us to make more profit, more money? Do we do it here? It takes a little bit longer, it's a little bit harder, it's gonna take more time, which they don't like. Uh, the stuff they need, is it making it up to there? I don't know. Personally, um, I like to work in organizations that look like this. Like I just almost disregard kind of the wants and needs of Wall Street, essentially. If you're going to build product, you have to be willing to invest, and you should invest your time here. Of course, everybody cares about creating a business that's sustainable in the long term, but like this is probably more of a healthy structure that I like to see. Actually, I like to see even less here and more of this and this, a little bit more of a direct path there. So there is a point. Um, my my long-winded point is that customer-focused companies are leading the way. They're innovating and they're winning. They use big data and little data, and this is where we're going to kind of transition over to, to the whole point here. So one of the things I like to do when I'm thinking about a company or evaluating a company and trying to determine whether or not they're kind of customer focused is I like to think about a pop quiz. I like to make sure that I can evaluate whether or not they understand their customer. So the first thing I do when I look at building a team or implementing a customer focused company that's going to use big data and little data together to really understand is I try to evaluate a couple things. Can everyone in the company answer who is our customer? Can they give consistent answers on who is the customer? Can they be specific? Um, if they're not, you get like inconsistent answers, like, oh, we're going after this person, no, we're going after that person. Uh, they can't provide details on who that customer is. Right? Oftentimes, it manifests itself as a persona, 
right, like a design target. Um, do we know what our customers like and dislike about our current offering in the market? And then when was the last time you, anybody at the company on that org chart, when was the last time you spoke with a customer, right? So like the customer service team will say, five minutes ago I talked to somebody. Somebody in the C-suite at the top end of the org chart will say, oh, that's a good point, I haven't done that before. I should probably do that once a year. I'll make a visit to the customer service team. Hopefully that's not true, but that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Um, and what is your team doing to improve the customer experience? Like every team should be able to articulate something that they're doing to improve the customer experience. And then lastly, this is where kind of the reality sets in. It's like when you've built a practice, does everyone in the organization know where to go to learn about the customer? To me, that's like, my job, right? I run a research team. We're part of an analytics and insights team. I want to make sure that whenever someone says, hey, where would I go if I wanted to learn more about the customer? They're talking about our team, this analytics and insights team. And if you kind of think about scoring your company, the place where you work, like where do you think you guys would fall if you took this pop quiz? Would you be like shaking, like spilling the water? Um, or would you end up on the good or not so good? It's okay if you end up over there because now you have kind of like an action plan for how to make it better. Um, the other thing we try to do at JET in particular is we're always trying to break people out of silos. We try to think about the entire customer experience, not just your stuff. And this is a really simple exercise that I think anyone in design, analytics, research can, can take advantage of, which is really creating kind of journey maps. I know this concept, people are talking about it all the time, but really this is all it is. You take your entire experience and you print out every single step of the experience and you put it on the wall and you start mapping pain points and delighters to every step, drawing from every source of data you have. Hey, I know we get a ton of customer service calls on this step. Um, I know from our analytics that a lot of people drop out of this step. Um, I know that from research that we're doing, a lot of people complain about this or love this. Uh, you can map all those pain points. So like for JET, we have to think about that whole journey. Whenever we have a conversation about a feature, even if it's like right over here on this one little random page, we ask ourselves, but how do I get to that page? Like I can't understand how to make that one little feature better until I understand every step and what's working and not working. Because the solution to making this thing better on this one little step might be way over there. Maybe the TV commercial needs to do a better job of telling you what to expect when you visit the website. So all the way over there, we have discovery. We have the initial experience when the customer visits the website for the first time. We have the shopping experience when you're searching and browsing, going to detail pages, trying to decide whether or not to buy something. And then you have the moment when you decide you might want to add something to the cart. And then you have that moment when you say, all right, I'm ready to check out. What are the pain points and delighters there? What happens after I place the order? Did you send me a message to tell me that it was successful? When should I expect it? Um, what, what's happening during the delivery phase? Is it going to be delivered to my front door, my back door? Is it going to my workplace? What should I expect during that step? If I have an issue, the customer service team, what's that experience like? Right? We pay attention to every detail. So for instance, when you call our customer service line, sometimes people get kind of, uh, ironically and amazingly, they get a little bit frustrated when, you, when they answer because we've taken the time to make the customer service like recording really fun and entertaining. So people will be like, hold on, can you put me back on hold so that I can listen to the end of the joke? Um, so we pay attention to the entire journey and make it a delightful experience across the whole uh, journey. Uh, and then our end goal is to get you to repeat. We want you to become a loyal customer. So we've really fought hard to say, always think about the whole journey and map every insight you have from every data source you have to this journey. It's a simple thing. Um, the exciting thing is when you start walking around the office and you see this, you know, a lot of people like having these conversations where they've clearly kind of taken the idea and they're like embracing it and starting to map pain points to like sub aspects of some feature. I feel like right now I'm doing a lot of this, like peacocking. Uh, so uh, before I go any further, uh, I do have a team. So uh, it's not just me. Uh, one of my team members is out here. Um, but uh, Anyways, uh, we have a small team because what I'm about to burn through, you're probably going to think, oh, how many people do you have on that team? We're not going to have a budget like that. I'm going to show you what you can do with a scrappy little team. Um, so Mindy, Kara, Maddie, and myself uh, represent our analytics and insights kind of research practice. Um, okay, so one of the first things you have to think about if you're going to start blending big and little data, you get, who's your team? 
right? Like, who do you need to hire, right? We just went around the room, people were talking about who they need to hire. You should be thinking about the same thing if you're going to start really thinking about how to create this holistic view of the customer and their experience. So for us, data science, I, I, there, I didn't really map them to people so well here. He did seem kind of analytical. <laughs> Uh, he seemed like he was always trying to find the right thing to do, so optimization, this is your A-B testing person. Um, research, uh, just he seems to be like the, the go-to guy for like, what is a demogorgon? And discovering all these different <laughs> things. Uh, and then, uh, is it Scott? Is that his name? Steve. Steve. He had all that advice for like how to uh, meet the girl and the hair spray, if he saw Stranger Things too. So, we also have behavioral economists on our team. Uh, we'll soon have two, right now we have one. A behavioral economist is someone who takes psychology, data, analytics, true experimental design into the workplace and can answer questions like, hey, if we send them this promo versus this promotion code or this type of promotion code, which one is more likely to appeal to the customer? Which one is more likely to generate a long-term relationship with the customer and create a loyal customer? So we've uh, started hiring behavioral economists. By a good one to read up on if you're interested in that is uh, Dan Ariely. He's kind of the thought leader in that space right now. Um, okay, and then the other part of this is you got to understand who are your demogorgons, right? Like, what are the problems blocking you? Um, there's uh, Billy. I was trying to figure out should I use the demogorgon or Billy? They were both kind of evil. Stranger Things too. You've seen it, right? Okay, no, no, there's no spoiler. Relax. Uh, okay. Uh, so you got to understand, like, what, it, what is kind of the thing that could prevent you from creating the successful practice of, like, blending the big data and the little data together? Silos, so it's someone saying, oh, you got to go over there for that data. you got to go talk to that team for that. Um, oh, we don't know how to access that data. you got to know SQL. Um, oh, you got to go talk to the UX team if you want to change that. you got to break that down and start thinking about we, we own the whole journey. Um, moving slow is another demogorgon, right? It's, like, really annoying when... Uh, like anybody at Jet, if you told them, oh, it's going to take uh, six months to move that text on the page, we're sitting there thinking to ourselves, we did a lot of stuff in that short period of time, ranging from building website, building an app, uh, building those huge fulfillment centers, uh, building a photo studio. That was all done in like months. So for us to hear anything about taking a long time to do something is kind of difficult to stomach. Bureaucracy can also be one of your demogorgons. Um, okay, now one of the other things you can do, really quick and easy thing you can do from a kind of little data thing, this is something uh, we used to do uh, at Amazon, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why it matters, but first things first, when you're building a product, you usually build it in a place like this, right? The corporate office, uh, it looks like this. You got your kitchen, your fancy kitchen, you got everybody in business, casual costumes. Um, and everybody's talking about how they know their customer, right? Um, well, this is the real world, right? This is what the real world looks like. This is where the people that are using your product live. Um, this is where they work, and, and this is what their world looks like. They're busy, you know, they value time with friends and family. Uh, they're tired. So, like, when I think of a Jet.com customer shopping for diapers, I can't imagine someone sitting down, smiling, right? It's like, they're, they... This is probably how they feel. So I need to make it fast and easy, and if I mess up, I need to take care of that. That's why we value the customer service component. So it's a different experience when I'm thinking about designing something for this person versus an, uh, a, a room of business casual folks who, who think the customer is showing up and spending all sorts of time with our product. So my long story short here on this is that these worlds are not the same, okay? They're not at all alike. Those are a bunch of different ways to mathematically represent, like, not even close to or not even alike. Um, and, you know, you can build your cool office and you can hire a bunch of hipsters to kind of make it cool. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, your customer could react to your experience like that, right? Um, so the key is that the products are made in one environment that's totally artificial and not real, but your products are used elsewhere. So one of the things we used to do at Amazon, and I really liked this, um, is get the customer in the room. Everybody talks about, oh, it's too expensive to like do research and, and get these insights. Well, in reality, 
all you have to do is save a seat for them. So before we started meetings, when we were having a, uh, an important conversation about a, the experience or, or the purpose for a product or feature, we would actually kind of pause the meeting and go get a chair, bring it in, make it, leave it empty, and say that chair represents the customer. That's the voice of the customer, okay? So before we make this decision, what would the customer want? In this conversation, how would they feel? What would be important to them? Would they say, yeah, launch that, or would they say, oh, it's not quite ready? It's a very simple thing you can do. Uh, another thing you can do, uh, go visit your call center, your customer service team, right? Like now, just go. Uh, wherever those calls are coming in, get in there, right? That's your opportunity to meet with the customer. And if you can't go to them, bring it to you. So, you know, when you call a customer service line, uh, some of the calls are recorded for quality control purposes. Well, this is your quality controls. You can, you can pipe those calls out to your, your headquarters and you can organize an opportunity for everybody to listen along to some really good customer service calls that either represent a pain point or a delighter. That really helps everybody connect with who is the customer and what's working and not working. Um, and then another thing, right, it's about getting data. And, and not just the big data, but the little data too. Spend time with your customer. Again, people think that's really expensive, but this was one of my favorite places to do it. I'm from Seattle, um, and this was my favorite place to do it. Let's see if you kind of figure it out. Not on the street, not at the Pike Place Market, but uh, here, right there. That was my favorite spot to be like, all right, we got this app idea or this app that we're developing. I would always be like, all right, cool, I'm going to hit the field. I would head down, head to the ferry. The ferry has Wi-Fi. It has a captive audience. They're, they're going to be on that boat for like 30, 40 minutes. It's oftentimes people commuting as well as tourists. So you've got people from all over the country kind of using this thing. It's a great opportunity to get out in the field and say, hey, while you're on the ferry, do you have 10 minutes to, at, to, to take a look at an app idea or a product I'm working on and give me some feedback? It makes for an amazing office. Really simple thing to do. You can just print out a field guide so you can have a scripted list of questions, bring gift cards so you can pay them a couple dollars for their time. Uh, do short 15-minute sessions to really get that feedback quickly. And don't be creepy, of course. Uh, and then another place you can do this is a coffee shop, right? They're everywhere. In Seattle, I feel like you can't go anywhere without bumping into a coffee shop. So like, this is the most logical place. Um, you have people just hanging out, right? When people are sitting at a coffee shop, they're probably hanging out and relaxed, so they won't be too bothered if you intercept them and ask if they're willing to give you a little bit of feedback on something you're working on. Um, so the cool thing here is they're already probably there with their device. It might be their laptop, their phone. Uh, you can bring a device for them to use and again just kind of bring a scripted guide, gift cards, and uh, get the feedback you want and need to improve your product. Now you can't do this everywhere. Here are the places I recommend. So like you can, you can intercept people on a bus. I already showed you you can do a boat. Uh, while someone's commuting in some capacity, not driving, but commuting, um, you can grab people right off the street as they're walking by and just say, hey, I need some feedback on this, right? Uh, coffee shops, that is not a hospital. That's supposed to be um, a home. I need to make that a home <coughs> icon. Um, okay, don't do it at these places. It's going to look suspicious if you try to do that at a bar or at a restaurant as people are having a romantic dinner. Hey, do you guys have time? Uh, okay, so anyways, what you want to do is go to where your customers live, work, and play. Go with a small group. We usually use between three and four people when we do this, and we mostly go to people's homes. Uh, but we have gone to coffee shops as well. But over the course of my career, like I've gone to all of them, have not made the mistake of the bar and the airplane. Um, but anyways, go with minimal gear. You don't need anything other than a notepad. Um, and train your folks before you go out. Just give them some best practices. Time your sessions intelligently. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to try to grab people that are commuting when you're in the middle of like rush hour commuting in Manhattan. Um, maybe you do it when it looks like that. Um, and expect the unexpected, right? You're going to uncover all sorts of nuggets in this, in this research that you're doing. Uh, one of the things we also do at JET is in-person studies. So every week we have customers come in to our office in Hoboken and they participate in live shop-alongs. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to get feedback from folks uh, right in front of us, right? Really do those kind of in-depth interviews. We've set it up so it's just rolling. 
right? We don't do this whole like, hey, we're doing a study this year. Uh, give me what you want to include in the study six months in advance. We just have this thing up and running. It's a machine. And you just kind of plug in your questions. So we field questions from every part of the organization. Um, it kind of looks like this, um, but it doesn't even have to look like that. We actually have it set up so that it's kind of streamed out to the entire company. Um, much like this screen is represented on these TVs, we just have it broadcast throughout the entire company. So as a session is underway, anybody can go to our uh, internal website and view the session as it's happening in real time. Um, you know, we're always kind of taking those insights, immediately updating the website. Uh, we're observing things, we're summarizing things, we actually do that in real time. So the, the note taker who's moderating is also sharing their notes in real time in our internal uh, chat platform. Um, so you're actually just seeing the notes, you're seeing the session, it's kind of amazing, it's all like real time. Um, sorry, clicker is acting up, okay. Uh, all right, and then we monster truck that, right? It wouldn't work if we didn't tell anybody about it, so we do our whole, hey, Tuesday, Thursday, uh, and make sure everybody in the company knows that we do this every week, right? And that we have sessions happening, so it's a known thing. It's something that uh, everybody in the company is very proud of. It's part of the culture. It's like, oh yeah, we spend all sorts of time with our customers. So now, you know, like the, the new generation of folks coming right out of college are in our workplace, like, wow, this is kind of amazing. I didn't realize companies did this. Um, so it's kind of a cool thing. When we have uh, new employees enter the company, they're also uh, informed about this, right? The, the fact that we do this, they're encouraged to watch these sessions to quickly ramp up, right? There's no faster way to ramp up than to watch people actually trying to use the product you're building. Okay, here's our lab. This is what it looks like. Little video, it looks like a little tiny Manhattan apartment. Uh, pretty cramped, but that's what we like about it, right? It feels real. Um, this is a picture of it. Uh, we, won't, we literally kind of made it look like a living room, right? We've all seen labs. Um, even the word lab is weird, laboratory. It's not. It's like a little mini living room. We even, I don't want to say we leave it messy, but like we don't go above and beyond and like clean it up and sterilize it because we really want it to feel a little bit like a home. So when folks come in and participate in our sessions, they're actually feeling like, hey, we want this, like more natural feedback than you might give elsewhere. We also have eye tracking. None of this is as expensive as you think, right? This was just a room that was empty. And we're like, we want that room and we want to turn it into to a place that we can dedicate to the customer. So when our leadership walks through the building and they, maybe they're giving a tour to the press, one of the first things they can do is open up the door and say, hey, here's our lab. We spend all sorts of time with our customer immediately uh, you know, communicates to everyone that joins the company, visits the company, that the customer is a part of our culture. Here's a video. This is what it looks like when we run a session. The eye tracking is the little red dot. So watch that red dot. As you'll see, when shoppers add an item to their gen cards, they automatically shrink the prices of millions of other products. <laughs> so, when we were trying to figure out what's the story we want to tell to the customer, this is one of those moments where it was like the big data, little data, blending it all together. All right, we had all the, the instincts to say, let's make this thing funny. Uh, but when we were building this commercial, we had a variety of cuts. And we were in there actually giving feedback to the, the folks creating the commercial, the marketing team that was helping to manage the production, so that we could say, yes, they did notice the tattoo on the stomach, right? Uh, yes, they did find it funny. And yes, they paid attention to the key things we wanted to communicate, like the laser zapping the price. That was a quick way to visually tell the story of prices drop as you shop, right? It's kind of a difficult thing to tell. But because of this approach of like using data to help inform that, we knew that the commercial was probably going to resonate, um, at least be comprehensible and tell the story. Um, and then because of the format we're in, you know, we're able to follow up the, the participant, the customer here and say, so what, what was that? What is Jet? What did you learn? Like, what do you think they sell? So we're able to get a variety of touch points here to really understand whether or not that commercial was going to work. Now, when we run a session, which again, we run every week, uh, we have the, you see the little red dot bouncing around? We know what people are looking at. 
um, as they're shopping, right? So it gives us that ability to kind of understand, are they noticing this over here? Like, we're giving them free shipping. Did they notice the moment when we said, hey, you've earned free shipping, right? That's something UX and design, you're always wondering, why is no one paying attention to that? It didn't help with conversion when we rolled this feature out. Well, we usually know because of this approach uh, whether or not the customer is likely to notice the feature at all. And then likewise, um, what do they think about it? How do they feel? You can, she's not doing a lot of talking, but she's sharing her thoughts as she's shopping. Okay. And then it's not enough, right? Hoboken, right? New York, you can't just rely on this one source of data. So going back to the theme of like, how do you extend that reach, right? Like it's too small, it's too local if you're just focused on Hoboken and, and New York. So one of the other things we do is we do remote testing. This is an ability to quickly uh, get results in minutes. So you're working on some feature, some capability, you can quickly deploy that out to the entire country for feedback. Very similar to the in-person interview. You basically kind of specify the demographics of the type of person you'd like to meet with. You create a script. I want you to go download my app and I want you to try it out. I want you to do X, Y, and Z. Go to my website. Uh, find a pair of shoes that you find attractive that you might want to buy. Um, and then they get to participate in those studies from the comfort of their own home. Uh, and then you end up with something like this. This might be kind of loud, or not at all, um, which is fine. Okay, um, so basically this video represents kind of what you get back. You get a video, you can see over here, this is like the script telling the participant, hey, we want you to do X, Y, and Z. And then over here, she's actually kind of talking out loud about um, what she's thinking as she's shopping, which extends our reach beyond just the Hoboken and New York area. This is called a remote testing method. And there's a couple ways you can do it. It's way less expensive than you would think. Uh, the, the popular tools right now are Validately and usertesting.com. Um, those are a couple of good sources for doing that. And again, you get, you get back this video plus audio. Of course, not when I'm presenting, though. Okay, and then you end up with all this video footage, right, from your user testing sessions, your in-person interviews. You create your own little, in our case, Jetflix, right? It's like people can go and watch these videos. So we archive all these videos and people can just dive in, right? A new employee joins the company. There's hundreds of videos of customers using the product for them to watch and learn and quickly ramp up. Um, another thing that we do that kind of blends the big data, the little data, the really qualitative insights with the quantitative insights uh, is NPS. Have you guys heard of the NPS as a methodology, net promoter score? Okay. If not, you should look it up. It's a kind of standard method for getting customer satisfaction feedback from uh, your customer. It helps you track when people are talking negatively about your brand, what are they talking about, right? They're talking smack. So what are they saying, right? And then for the people that love your brand, what are they saying? What's their sphere of influence on the people around them? Now, for us, we do this every single day. Uh, right? We showed you, you can do the in-person interviews, those are time consuming. Well, for this, we have uh, hundreds of these flowing in every single day, right? And the responses are an open-ended comment, like I give you a zero or a 10 or an eight or seven, and then they fill out in a little box that says, well, here's why. Um, okay, now in order to do that, right, like it's really annoying when people run these surveys and they do them once a quarter usually, we're doing it every day, but you do it like once a quarter and uh, the data gets summarized in a report that's saved in some folder that you don't have access to. Um, so we try to make sure that we can always share the data that we're capturing. So for instance, for the survey, when it goes out, it looks like this, right? It's, it's like, you probably can't see it from there, but it says something to the effect of, uh, how likely are you to recommend Jet to a friend or colleague? Um, zero out of 10, so you can answer this survey right in the email. As soon as an answer comes in, again, it gets shared directly with the rest of the company in real time, the individual response. So you can read that individual response if you want. Um, then we also create these dashboards that enable you to consume this data in the aggregate view, right? You don't want to read every single comment. I do. Every day, I start my day with reading those comments. But I also have my view on the aggregate number. So the, what is our overall score for all customers? Of course, I blurred that out, okay? Um, and then if you want to dig deeper, remember it was an unstructured open-ended box, like right in your answer? Those answers go right here, and guess who's reading those and helping me categorize them? The customer service team. Because when they're not taking calls or they're not responding to an email, they're delighted at the opportunity to actually participate in improving the product 
and getting involved in like design and, and analytics and research. So they're actually reading those, helping me summarize them to create these dashboards. Okay, now one thing to note, you have all these insights, uh, you know, what do we do with them? There's usually a couple types. There's like the ones that are like, that is obvious. We need to just fix that. That's just silly. Like, don't even talk about it. Let's fix it. And again, move fast when we fix it. And then there's the other ones like, I don't know how to fix that. Uh, we should test it maybe. This is kind of moving into more quantitative methods that we use. So for this one where we're like, I don't know exactly what to do, we use A-B testing. Um, do you guys know what A-B testing is? Okay, cool. So I can kind of skip all that. Uh, so you know what this is. People visit your site. Some are going to see version A. Some are going to see version B. Um, you know, the, you kind of randomize the sample so that you can quantitatively determine like which version's better. Uh, so for us, we care a lot about this page. This is the spot where you kind of make your decision about whether or not you're going to purchase something. We care special attention about this area. It's called like the buy box in e-commerce. It's where you're making your purchase decision. Um, so we do things like this, version A or version B? Like which one's going to convert better? From where you are, you probably can't even see the differences. It seems imperceptible, like there's a difference. It's this versus this. Which one do you think would do better, A or B? Okay. Uh, it's B. Because the human mind likes to instantly process things. So. Over here, I have to ask myself, well, how fast is your delivery? And then I have to read this page, and I have to say, deliver in. Oh, I'll translate it as two-day delivery. So by just saying free two-day delivery plus free returns, we're telling you everything you want to know plus your next question, which is, if I do order this thing, what's your return policy? So by answering those questions, you can increase your conversion rate. So we use this quantitative method to exper use an experimental design to determine the winning treatment. And likewise, we've probably already put it through three, four rounds of in-person user testing, focus groups, those coffee shop intercepts. And then again, you know, I have tons of examples of these and I'm gonna just kind of zip through them, but like B or C? What do you think, B or C? B? Okay. C. And it's because one of the first things is like with a new brand, you need a little bit of help. Right? Like, I'm going to go through this process of purchasing, making my first purchase, you know, sweeten the deal for me, right? So, like, by giving them a promotion code, that increases the conversion rate. And then silly little things, right? I use this example because you can barely even see the difference between these three. Um, the only difference is here we've added retail price. So you have a reference for, like, what's the original retail price? Over here it says retail price, plus we then labeled this and said jet price. So which one do you think would win, A, B, or C? See, I thought C, too. Uh, it's not. It was B. And it wasn't my opinion, right? Because we used A-B testing, collected the data, figured out which one was better, blended that stuff with all the stuff we had seen in the lab to really explain it. As soon as you add the name jet price, then it, it creates all these questions for the customer. Jet price? Well, what, 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 what's the non-jet price, right? It creates questions for the customer. It also, every time you add something to the page, you take away something from everything else, right? It can become clutter. I don't need labels. I know that the numbers next to a product are probably the price. So, like, the more labeling you do, ironically, and you're being more literal, which I tend to be, so I thought C, less is more. Okay. So, anyways. Yeah, oh, yeah. I was yeah. going to ask you, like, what kind of differences are you seeing between those? Is this like a half a percent type of difference, or is it like a five percent type? And then, how big of a sample size are you? We use a statistically significant sample size based on our overall traffic volume. So it is a true quantitative method using an experimental design. Um, that's the first thing. And the set, the first question was like, what kind of uh, improvement are we seeing? Uh, I, I can't say specifically, right? Because like I don't want to reveal proprietary data here. But uh, anything from like, you know, double digit percentage percentage increases for some of these tests down to just minute incremental improvements, right? So like the labeling one, that was more kind of on the incremental improvement, like smaller. But it doesn't matter because if you're doing these all the time, which we are, we do these every week, different little tests, it all adds up. So at the end of a month when you've done 30 of these and you've improved just little amounts, it adds up to something big at the end. Okay, and then as you're starting to see, uh, what we do is we layer data. 
right? So for everything we do, like pretend that's just a feature there that we launched, we'll have our real-time insights coming from our lab and our, our uh, feedback channels. We'll have a dashboard. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because you already know what a dashboard is. Uh, you know, and then we'll have the NPS type data where we can look at, well, what's the satisfaction? Uh, we'll have the representative national feedback from that remote testing method I mentioned. We'll have surveys. Sometimes we'll do a custom survey on some specific thing. Uh, A-B testing. Um, and then that in-person testing that we do, sometimes with the eye tracking as well. So when you really think about it, when we go to talk to the business team and we're giving our opinion, it is representing big and little data, right? Experimental design, high volume, A-B testing, blended with the smaller little pieces of research. And when you roll all that up, you're really getting that 40,000 foot view. Um, okay, so when you've captured all these insights, this is usually what it looks like after you catch, capture a bunch of insights. Right? You got all these opportunities, all these nuggets, and you're like, I, I know what we should do to make this better. I've got a ton of ideas, and you don't get them anywhere, right? Mostly because going back to what I talked about earlier, you've got to understand your org structure, you've got to understand your demogorgons, um, and you've got to figure out what you're failing to do as an individual to kind of drive that change. Um, so here's a couple quick things we do. Um, I want to leave time for questions. So. One of the first things we do is really simple, the voice of the customer meeting. So we take all that stuff we're learning through all those research methods, and we make sure that uh, we're presenting the stuff we're finding down here directly to these people at the top. Right? It's meant to say, here are all the things we've learned, and we're presenting them to the leadership. Not only that, I'll show you though, we do it monthly. We present those customer experience metrics. It represents your opportunity to talk about the customer with leadership. Uh, you should specifically target the leadership because here's the other pro tip, which is like if leadership starts talking about it, then everyone beneath them is like, well, wait a minute, what are they talking about? I want in on that, right? So it's a good way to kind of get that buy-in. Um, you really highlight the pain points and delighters, and you, you present to the leadership team the customer journey. You say, don't forget, we're not going to talk about this one little metric today or this one sales element. I want to talk about the whole journey and give you a very quick update on the entire journey, what's working at each touch point. And you democratize access to that. So although I said, make it for the leadership and, and speak their language, democratize it. Make it available to everyone. Get it out there. Okay. The other thing is transparency, right? So you capture all this data. Everybody is good at capturing data at this point, right? Like, who, who is not capturing tons of data? The real problem, though, is um, it feels like this, right? Like, I, it, I, I don't even know how to get started. I don't know SQL. How do I get access to that dashboard? Who owns it? What does the number even mean? This is how I feel, right? And I work in the field. Uh, and uh, it feels like this, that you're like tapping into the matrix and all I want to do is get some numbers to help me understand things. Um, it really doesn't need to be this way. We try to make it feel like this, right? Like you're in this wonderland of data. Uh, it's a little scary, but it's still a delightful feeling. Um, and the way that we do that is some really simple tips and tricks to make sure that the qualitative and the quantitative stuff is really blended well together. The first is when you build a dashboard, make it visual. Try to appeal to the human desire to see symbols and imagery and trends visually as opposed to numerically. Provide the numerical representation, but always make sure you present the visual version of the data, that aggregate view, as well as the raw data. And I showed you that like we're doing things like even though you fill out the survey, you usually expect this big summary report once a year if the team will do it but we stream it out to you in real time, every single response. So you're getting the individual, and then we take the time to create the aggregate view in that dashboard, and then we also create the highly visual view that gets rolled up into that voice of the customer meeting for the kind of snapshot. Um, and then also, just take some time to, to brand it a little bit, right? So like we do simple things like, hey, if you're gonna send out a map or presenting something related to our customers, at least make it purple, and use a map that's like nice to look at. Uh, Again, just kind of try to make it, uh, elevate your game on the visuals when it comes to presenting data. The other thing we do is we're not afraid to kind of talk about our data throughout the whole company, pretty much every level. Most people have full visibility into like how we're doing the sales, uh, our NPS score, uh, and, and we have these meetings um, 
at least a couple times a week, we share insights uh, among teams to the whole company. Everybody invited, it's recorded, you can watch it later if you can't make it. And then the other thing we try to do at Jet is you get all those insights, you gotta move fast. Again, I need to swap this out because it doesn't really jive with moving fast. It's like a turtle, I, should, I, I keep saying I need to flip it so that it's the dog with the turtle on the back. So, moving on. Uh, Basically, my, my summary slide on this is like, you saw what we did in less than a year. Like, building one of those fulfillment centers, I feel like that was like a major achievement for everyone. That was like people at Jet who are like, yeah, I work on the marketing team, but I'm going to the fulfillment center. We gotta move boxes over there. Uh, so like, all that crazy stuff we did in a year, it's a good uh, way to think about like, am I aiming too low with my speed on getting stuff done with respect to projects? And one of the other things is like, right now sentiment moves faster than ever with your customers. So like, they can go from like to dislike very quickly, and they can go from one or two people disliking to everyone disliking very quickly. So you can't sit around and wait for problems to be solved. You gotta solve them. And then if you can't tie back a direct customer benefit uh, to the project you're working on, you should probably deprioritize it. This is what companies like Amazon do very well, is the, the ability to say, we're gonna change priorities here and work on the thing that's more important. Um, and again, patience is dwindling, so move fast. Um, and then my last kind of point is, is a little more at the organizational level. Again, tying it all together is like, uh, to be successful, you gotta take a look at your C-suite. Right? The C-suite, C stands for chief, and your C-suite is usually a CEO, chief executive officer, a C officer, a CFO, chief financial officer, a CTO, chief technical officer, um, and then COO, chief operational officer. Are any of those people thinking about the customer? Maybe not, I don't wanna say they're not for sure, but. Those are all people that are highly driven by numerical values. Uh, oftentimes, the easiest number to track is like sales, right? So they're, they're going to tend to track those numbers. What you need to do is get a chief customer officer. This is the new thing right now. So if you're in UX and you're trying to figure out your career path, you should be aiming for this, right? It gives you a seat at the table in the C-suite. Of course, the rest of the C-suite is gonna be like, what? <laughs> really? Who's that? <laughs> They exist, so when I, that was the reason I joined Jet, is because when I came out to interview, the person that interviewed me was the chief customer officer, and I was like, okay, that answers my first question, is is this company going to be customer obsessed and focused? Bam, answered. Um, okay, so anyways, and then creating that voice of the customer in the company, in the C-suite, right? So this person has the freedom and safety to say, uh, yeah, it would be great on the financials in the short term, but the customer wouldn't necessarily want us to do that next. So it gives that customer a voice in the C-suite. And they can represent CX, you know, customer experience holistically, right? And it helps the company think beyond quarterly views of the world, right? We're highly driven by like when your next earnings report is coming out. That chief customer officer can say, hey, let's invest in the future and invest in some of these projects that are gonna benefit the customer in the long term. And if you don't have one, get one. And if you don't have one, uh, you need to think about that because you may not have like your, your stakeholder at that executive level uh, yeah. battling it out for business priority as you guys are making decisions. And then lastly, maybe you should try to become one. So like many companies, I keep hearing about people saying, yeah, I went in and asked, why don't we have one of those? And, and I keep telling people, go in there and tell them, how about you just make me that person? Okay, and then here's your classic summary slide. Um, again, quiz everyone at work. Make sure they know who's the customer and can articulate good answers. Think about the entire experience, not just your silo, your feature, your team. Uh, get the customer in the room. Spend lots of quality time with the customer. Start doing a monthly voice of the customer meeting. And find out if you have a CCO, Chief Customer Officer. And if you don't, start talking about it. Like, where's our Chief Customer Officer? Um, and democratize access to data. And then know your demogorgons. Stranger Things, not a spoiler. You're fine. <laughs> uh, and then thank you for tuning in. Any questions? Yeah, uh, so we oh. do have, you have, okay. have 
Lots of great time for questions, but please, uh, we'll, we'll go around, we'll bring a microphone to you, and please just wait till we bring a microphone to you until you ask. Um, I think I saw a hand over here. Uh, thank you so much, and I learned a lot about Jet today, and uh, how company focus on the customer, so it was very uh, amazing to listen. And I have one question about the long-term customer value. So. Uh, as a company, uh, you mentioned about prioritization and how to uh, make sure that your customer is happy, but uh, how to measure that would be different. So for example, there would be the different metrics, and such as the sales, how the customer engagement, and the, how many customers be your size. So how do you make that trade-off between the, because sales can be the short-term uh, short-term uh, metric uh, while you need to make sure that how to grow your company and how your customers uh, in the long term uh, uh, engage in your 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 company so the how do you make sure that you make trade that trade-off uh, in a right way in uh, for the customer in the long term Thank you. yeah uh, no that's a good question so quantitatively we look at that a couple different ways to track it Right. We think about, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with this concept, probably, but uh, RFM, uh, recency, frequency, and monetary um, tracking capability. So it's like understanding when is the last time someone visited your product or used it? Uh, how often are they using it? And then the M could be anything, right? Like not everybody has like a monetary approach, but uh, that could be how much are they spending? Where are they spending? So that's like the, the way to track it classically. Um, I tend to also add a bunch of other data to that to understand loyalty and building a good relationship with the customer. I like to layer in those other smaller data points. They're not small though, but it's NPS is another good one to layer in there. Because again, that's asking the question to the customer, how likely are you to recommend Jet to someone else? How likely are you to repeat purchase? So I try to blend, I, I start to first encourage the company to start talking about loyalty outside the context of just sales. Because they, they, there's a tendency to always look at sales, not, not where we work so much, but most businesses, they go to the easiest number to track, which is almost, time, almost always like sales, revenue, right? That's what Wall Street wants to see. And you fall into the trap of just trying to drive that number up. And what you're kind of asking about is like, there's a tendency to do that. And it usually has a short-term or even long-term damaging impact to the customer experience. Um, so the first thing is like training people to start talking about loyalty within the context of uh, sentiment, satisfaction, and layering in additional metrics for them to look at, especially with a tool like Voice of the Customer. That is your additional data set. And you can start talking about how to nurture loyalty, how to build loyalty. So that's kind of how we go about it. Striking a balance between the two, that kind of, that's a tricky question and it varies by industry. So like I could tell you all about e-commerce, but I don't think that would help. The short answer is like building loyalty is hard. You have to have a good product first. Like that's the hardest thing that I sometimes have to talk to people about in other industries is they're like, oh, we have this loyalty problem. And I'm like, well, your product is not good. So like you're just going to spend a ton of money trying to get people to use it again. It's not a good product. So like sometimes the answer is like, you got to totally redo your product, create value, have a clear value proposition so that there's a reason, right? So like a good product oftentimes just becomes uh, adored and loved without all that marketing spend. And I personally gravitate towards products that I personally like and believe to be a good product and so I haven't had to serve a role where I'm like looking at like, geez, I can't solve this loyalty problem. Sometimes the answer is like, you got a bad product. Anyways, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when you were talking about the in-person invites, how do you vet, plan out who you're going to reach out to? Like what are the standards by which you kind of target these users? Yeah, so we think about uh, demographics and psychographics. So demographics are things like who's the customer we want, we want to go after? And those are more quantitative, right? So like demographics are things like age, gender, household income, uh, where they live maybe, um, 
pretty quantitative measures uh, that you can obtain either through your own data warehouse, um, you know, the data you have about your customer. You can also supplement that with other data sources to really understand, like, who's the customer I want to go after from a demographics perspective. But the more nebulous one, and the one that I think is even a little bit more important, is psychographics. This is a perfect example of blending, like, big data and little data. Psychographics is the, are the other elements. Like, is this person someone who uh, cares about some cause, right? Like, I want people that fit this profile that are also people that are community oriented and care about uh, some political view or some other view that, that fits maybe better with like the customer I'm targeting. Not always beliefs, but like maybe even just a state of mind, like this is a positive person. Maybe another psychographic would be like someone who, who likes Stranger Things <laughs> um, and also watches some other show. That would be more kind of on the psychographic side. So like we, we create a clear profile of who we want from a demographics and psychographics perspective. And then on the tactical side, which I think is the other part of your question, which is how do you get them? Was that part of it too? Yeah. So the best way to do that is with a market research firm. It's not that expensive. Um, you know, you can do it. You can negotiate a good price, especially if your profile is pretty basic, right? Like if you're building an app that you think everyone in the world should be able to use, your profile is going to be pretty broad. So like it's easy for them to recruit someone. But if you're talking about I want somebody who wears fry boots and is like a hipster that blah, 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 and you're getting really narrow, you're going to pay more. So anyways, I recommend if you're going to do what we're doing, which is like having this rolling method of bringing people in, work with a market research firm. It's cheaper. Otherwise, you're going to have a person at work just fully dedicated to that, and they're going to be constantly getting cancellations. And put it in the hands of a market research firm. It's much cheaper. You can also do it online. So using the remote methodology, you just literally specify the demographics. So if you use Validately and user testing, you can actually specify all that. And it's very reasonably priced way less expensive than the in-person market research. Hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, so my question is related to what you just said. Um, you mentioned some very specific uh, features for the customers that you're looking for. Uh, is that for a specific feature that you're testing or you're just making sure that you are testing a wide range of groups? Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, it was kind of about like, well, do you do you shift your demographics and psychographics based on what you're testing? We always start with the core, like who's the customer we're really going after, right? We start with that as the base, and then there are times when we say, well, hey, maybe we want to look at the uh, the baby category. In that case, I really have to make sure they're a parent, and that not just a parent, but that they have a baby between zero and you know between one day and X number of months old. So it totally varies, but we always have a base kind of profile that has psychographics and demographics, and then we kind of make the choice if it's like a specific thing that we want to evaluate. So the answer is yes, we do have to customize, but for the most part, it's kind of uh, the same customer coming in, just little pivots. Mm -hmm. And then there was one here. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted it. What were the two most surprising things you learned from the customers? Yeah, so what were the two most surprising things we learned from the customer? Um, it's interesting because it's been, it's been a wild ride, so like there's a lot. Um, the surprising stuff is mostly, for me, it originates from the A-B testing, right? Like I, I'm kind of an uh, uh, experimental design person by education so I'm into that but like I'm always surprised by the little minute changes we make and how they can have a big impact on perception so that's one thing is like making those little changes can have a big impact that's one surprising thing and then the other uh, thing I've learned from the customer is it's really important to have uh, legitimately uh, sincere kind of customer centricity Right, like I've, I've helped build products over the course of my career that were mostly transactional, like, oh, you're gonna do this and you pay this and the value is in the thing you're using and, and who cares who sold it to me and all that stuff. But at Jet, we kind of created a brand that people adore. You can see from the commercial that like we have a sense of humor, we like to have fun. Uh, you can see that like it, 
hopefully it comes through here, but like that permeates everything from the purple box to the website shopping experience, uh, all the way through the way we handle customer service. So for me, the second thing is just like the power of brand and how important it is to have authenticity in your brand. You can't fake that, right? Like I didn't even, I'm still amazed at how it just happened spontaneously because we really built a, a strong team that really understands like how to do it right and how to build a business that invests in the right places. Like usually you add your customer service team later. You're like, oh, we should probably get some customer service people. And by then it's too late and they're overwhelmed. We had more customer service people than we had employees when we launched because we're like, hey, we need to make sure this goes smoothly. And that means investing in the customer touch point first. So that I would say like on the spectrum, it's like little micro changes having a big impact and then the power of brand and authenticity to really kind of resonate with the customer. I don't know how to how you want to do. Okay, how about here? Can you talk to us a little bit about your NPS program? Sorry. Can you talk to us a little bit about your NPS program? Do you I saw that you do it in email. Do you have a, like a delighted or another vendor that embeds that, or do you program it yourself? And then when does it go out? Is it a certain time after post-purchase, for example, or, or another time like that? Yeah, no, those are good questions. I can tell you no NPS, because like you're basically hitting on an important point, which is like NPS is meant to capture the sentiment of your customer. So let's pretend you take a flight. You're on a plane. You're on, I'm not going to name an airline because I don't want to look like I'm supporting one or not, but you're flying. If I was to send you an NPS while you're on the plane, the outcome would be very different if I waited a week after you took your trip, right? Because if I wait a week after you take your trip and you went to Hawaii, you're going to be like, that flight was amazing, yeah. Because you're remembering the beach, the snorkeling, <laughs> the sun, and you forgot about the seat because I waited a week. So, short answer is I'm not going to give away all the details on how we do it because it's you can game things if you do that. But what I'll say is we wait until we know that you've received your item and that you've had the opportunity to use it and that you're at a point where you can give us good feedback that's constructive. So our timing is, is uh, considerate of that, okay? We do sample at high volume. So I mentioned we kind of, we don't skimp, right? Like most companies, as you probably know, they might do NPS like once a year. Like, oh, let's do our annual NPS or quarterly NPS and some small group at the company gets to see the score, right? Uh, we do it every day. Those NPS scores are rolling in in real time every day. Uh, so we do it every day. We do use a vendor uh, to help us with that because it's a lot, right? It'd be a lot to build all this. But uh, we use a vendor for part of it. And then what we've done to kind of weave it all together into like a real-time mechanism, that's all just hustle, just hard work, right? Flying out to the customer service team and saying, hey, you guys, I need you to go over here. I need you to log into this thing. Here's a spreadsheet. When someone says this, when they say, oh, I love your, I love how fast shipping is, just call that fast shipping, right? Like I give them the structure. I help them uh, figure out how to respond to different customers. Um, so parts of it are, are assisted by a couple tools that I'm not going to name, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's stringing it all together, right? It's like taking uh, members of my team that, that are like, all right, cool, I'll watch the Slack channel and monitor those incoming responses. Customer service team is in there and going, hey, should we respond to that? Um, and then likewise, other people kind of aggregating the data, extracting insights, a data scientist who would go in and say, hey, we've got tens of thousands of these at this point. How about we look at how this impacted future purchasing behaviors? So like, it is a tapestry of people involved, but everybody feels like they own it, right? Like if you were to go around and say, hey, what about NPS? They'd be, oh yeah, yeah, I own this part of it, it's great. So like there's buy-in just because they're participating in the process. Uh, does that answer your question? Sure does. Cool. We have, uh, have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Um, does anyone have anything juicy? Because I'm not going to go with you. Just kidding. No. <laughs> Controversial? No. Uh, you had your hand up for a long time, right? After? Yeah. Sure. Unless it's fast. I'll try to be fast. Um, so you've obviously had a spectrum of experience from small startup to very large companies. Um, and I, it looks like you guys run things very lean um, within Jet. 
but if Ben from right now could go talk to Ben from a smaller startup that had to be a little hungrier and a little leaner, maybe not hungrier, but leaner, uh, what's the biggest tip that you would give startup Ben? Yeah, I would say focus on the customer. Even when you're being asked to focus on the outcome, like sales. Because if you do it right with the customer, you're going to win in the long term, right? So that would be my first piece of advice. Uh, the second would be you can move faster. You feel like you always feel like you're moving fast, but like what I saw Jet and everybody there do in such a short period of time totally reframed my perspective on being fast. So my that would be my second piece of advice: like just move faster than you think you can. Um, and focus on the customer the whole way. Sorry? Did you say there's two long, two of them extra long, or? Oh no, those are my two things. That was, but that was the last question, right? Oh, but should we do one more? Or do we have time? <laughs> last one. Final. So, um, in respect to moving quickly uh, and running A-B tests at companies like Jet and Amazon, I was wondering if there was a certain philosophy about overlapping tests, about having multiple tests running at once, if you silo them, if you kind of just let the whole machine run as one big thing. I'm kind of wondering if you could extrapolate on that. Yeah, it's funny, that's a, you know A-B testing, I can see. Uh, so yeah, if you guys have ever experimented with A-B testing, the, the tricky part is like you run into situations where like one team wants to test one thing, and another, test, another team wants to test something else, and you get all these overlapping tests that get all convoluted and you don't know if you can interpret the results correctly. The long story short, and I hate to give you this answer, is that we have to carefully review every test we do. We determine when we think the overlap would impact the outcome and then we time it so that we don't have any too many things overlapping at once. We do have our own internal technology that we've built to try to uh, algorithmically address overlapping testing and how to interpret the results. And that's about all the deal, detail I can provide because like really our data scientist would be like, oh yeah, we well, hear the rules. And I would tell her, don't tell all the rules, but uh, we've built our own technology uh, to address that very problem. And we're still working on it. Okay, let's get a round of applause yeah. for Ben. Thanks, Ben. Um, Thank you. So we'll be back again next month. Uh, next month we're doing something a little more artsy. It's going to be fun. Um, I want to remind, remind everyone to come talk to Larry if you're interested in saving the world. Um, and uh, he'll, he's glad to talk to you too. All right. Again, um, chat, say hello, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.